celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, Senators ask, how did you arrive at those farmer aid numbers? Why 12 billion? Movement in the water. Three more states get the injunctions they were seeking against the WOTUS rule. In the Mississippi Delta, hundreds think rice and celebrate that crop with an unusual lunch. And pork, it's a commodity under pressure, but some think it's a perfect time to claim new market share. Will it come at the expense of producers? Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. No question, ag has been hit hard by America's trade war. In late July, the president announced a $12 billion aid package for farmers. The details came out a month later. Since then, everyone's been asking the same question. How did the USDA arrive at those numbers? We need to hold our trading partners accountable, but I am concerned that some of the trade actions we have seen in recent years are causing uncertainty and unpredictability for the agriculture industry. Senate Ag Chairman Pat Roberts made it clear he's fielded countless questions from constituents about the farmer aid package. Everyone in this hearing was here to discuss the factors that led to the trade war and the tariffs still coming out of it. American farmers cannot be collateral damage. It's estimated that American dairy farmers will take a $1.5 billion hit this year due to tariffs imposed by Mexico and China. USTR As Ambassador Greg war, Dowd echoed Robert's concerns. Currently, the United States runs an agricultural trade deficit of over $15 billion with the EU. At the WTO, we are pushing forward the largest agricultural disputes in history against China for its market price support policies and unfair administration of its tariff rate quotas. But how did the USDA arrive at the numbers? Chief Economist Robert Johansson painted a complicated picture. Sense, we used a trade model that reflects essentially those commodities that were um, exported to the countries that are retaliating are going to show the highest trade damage effects from these tariffs. In other words, the more of a crop exported and the more retaliation by the country it was exported to, the higher the amount of relief U.S. farmers will receive. Not all crops are figured into the program, and the initial payment rate is only on 50 percent of production, and the payments are capped at $125,000 per farmer. Clearly, the aid package won't offset all of the economic damage of the tariffs. We still don't have a new farm bill, despite ongoing negotiations that remain at a near standstill. The president is blaming partisan politics for the delay. He tweeted this, Debbie Stabenow and the Democrats are totally against approving the farm bill. They are fighting tooth and nail to not allow our great farmers to get what they so richly deserve. Work requirements are imperative and the Dems are a no, not good. And Stabenow tweeted back, in part, in case you missed it, the Senate passed a bipartisan farm bill that got 86 votes, the most ever. The current farm bill expires September 30th. Ag Committee Politico reports that Chairman Pat Roberts says food assistance, SNAP, is still the biggest hangup. Recently, we reported that a judge in South Carolina had effectively erased a rule delaying the implementation of the controversial WOTUS rule, Waters of the United States. That ruling meant that WOTUS was in force in at least 26 states, including Mississippi. Now, though, according to the Mississippi Cattlemen's Association, after a threat by the Texas Attorney General to appeal to a higher court, a U.S. District Court has granted temporary injunctions to Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. As a result, WOTUS is in force in 23 states, on hold in 27. Mississippi Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson called it a, quote, big win for farmers and ranchers. Tennessee is now the only Mid-South state in which the WOTUS rule is not on hold. We'll continue to follow the story.
As a crop, rice contributes more than $100 million to Mississippi's economy. So every September, we celebrate National Rice Month with a rice tasting luncheon. Here's Farm Week's Amy Myers. We need bigger plates. Rice is the oldest known food that we still consume today. At the annual rice tasting luncheon, you'll learn it can be prepared in more ways than you can imagine. In about 22 minutes, we're going to say a blessing and then the masses come in. Right now, folks patiently wait as over 300 rice dishes are being prepared. But when the clock strikes 11 and the doors open, the room will be swarmed with about a thousand people eager to taste these unique dishes. What's probably the most unusual dish that you've seen? Uh, probably rice hot tamales. I had never seen that before a few years ago. Um, and then, of course, the rice desserts are always a hit. People really love those, and those are the first things that disappear. What was your favorite thing to eat today? Chicken salad. Cause of rice. The one that was my favorite, I guess, was the dessert. And it tasted like it maybe had caramel and chocolate in it. I will probably try to make that specific uh, rice dish for like a football game. It is one commodity that is true farm to table. Bolivar County is the largest rice producing county in the state of Mississippi. Mississippi ranks fifth in the nation and Bolivar County is first in Mississippi. So why not host the rice tasting luncheon right here? For tasty rice recipes, check out Between the Levees Cookbook. From Delta State University, I'm Amy Myers. What do the names Sedona Sun, Black Hawk and Onyx Red all have in common? I'd give you a clue, but I'd be stealing Gary Bachman's thunder and <laughs> that might get him hot under the collar. Here's Gary. This is a challenging time of the year in many ornamental flower gardens. The hot summer sun has burned away many of our full sun colorful flowers, but this is also the time of the year that the ornamental peppers are starting to show their true colors. Ornamental peppers love our hot and humid summers, and this helps the plants produce loads of pretty fruit. The selection of ornamental peppers is unbelievable. What a fun and unique way to add interest to your garden. When the pepper plants are producing, it's very common to have fruit in various stages of coloration. Here are some of my favorites. Sedona Sun produces a dazzling display in gardens with masses of fruit on small spreading mounds. The plants grow 9 to 12 inches tall with the small hot peppers held above the foliage. As the fruit mature, they range from bright lemon yellow to deep apricot orange. It's like having a rainbow of fire in the landscape. Blackhawk is a South Regional All-America selection. This plant produces adorable little ornamental peppers that start off black and change to a beautiful head-turning red. Onyx Red is another All-America selection that is adorned with eye-catching dark foliage. The color contrast between the foliage and the abundance of shiny black and red round fruit is striking. The fruit of ornamental peppers are edible, but extremely hot. Shishi Gashira, woo! Ah, uh, no, with age comes wisdom. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Well, I hope age comes with wisdom. Beautiful indeed. <laughs> they certainly are, Mike. On the other hand, though, our grain markets, not a thing of beauty this week. Corn and soybean prices weaken after the new crop report. Farm-raised catfish supplies increase while prices soften further. And is the African swine fever outbreak in China bullish or bearish for U.S. livestock markets? Well, it depends on who you ask. A surprise forecast for U.S. corn production this fall led to a drop in corn prices that continues as we record this edition of Farm Week. U.S. soybean and cotton production is also increasing compared to the August numbers from D.C. The latest September figures for U.S. corn project a 2% increase from a month ago to 14.8 billion bushels. The Mississippi forecast is unchanged. U.S. soybean production is also bumped up by 2% from August. 
now forecast to total a record 4.6 billion bushels. Mississippi production was not changed. And all U.S. cotton production also increased by 2% from August, with Mississippi production increased by 50,000 bales. Despite continuing trade tensions with China, analysts still maintain that foreign demand for U.S. soybeans will hold. Darren Newsom says that while China's demand may be trimmed back, demand from other areas will pick up. He explains it this way. China's just going to simply buy our soybeans from countries who it's not in a trade mm -hmm. war with. And so we're just going to have more middlemen pop up. That's not necessarily going to help basis because everybody's going to want their cut. But it is going to keep us moving some of our soybeans. So demand's still going to be there. I just don't see it supporting the cash market that much. One year from now, there may not be quite as many soybeans for the U.S. to export or corn either. Prices are down, and broker Nolan Cullen says he wouldn't be surprised if cotton picks up some present bean and corn acres when 2019 planting begins. Certainly the numbers are bearish for beans for the 1819 crop. Uh, no doubt with the price structures we're seeing now, corn in the 360 level, uh, soybeans in the uh, 870 to 8 to nine dollar level, we're going to see some transitioning. I think cotton producers will probably expand acres, but I don't think you'll see a lot of new acres going into cotton by former producers. Weather problems in other parts of the world are impacting global wheat production this year. The situation is actually boosting U.S. export sales of wheat right now. And trader Don Roos thinks it may bode well for the future too. We've got a very tight uh, world uh, situation. Stocks to use is the lowest we've had since 2013. We've just had too many world problems uh, with weather. Uh, we had Argentina had a problem uh, with a drought. Then we had Australia in a drought. Then the former Soviet Union in a drought. Then uh, Europe and now even Canada has some issues. So the bottom line is the uh, world production has just shrank enough that the U.S. Uh, only 7% of the world uh, market is uh, uh, we're trying to shift the export market as much as we can to the United States. But at the same time, we can't run too fast to the upside in the wheat market or we lose the business. Russia just picked up the Egypt, Egypt business last week, but we were very close. We're only $5 a metric ton under the cheapest wheat in the world, and that's Russia. It's time for our trivia quiz now on Farm Week. It is National Honey Month, the month of September, and honey is the topic for our question. See if you know the answer. How much honey does an average worker bee make in its lifetime? Is the answer A, one twelfth of a teaspoon, B, three fourths of a teaspoon, C, one teaspoon, or D, one tablespoon? We'll have that answer coming up. We'll take a short break, but stay right here. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, a timely piece on the pork industry. You'd think with the impact of the trade war, expansion would be the last thing on anybody's mind. But five new hog packing plants are scheduled to open, and more hog packers are expected to raise at least some of their own hogs. Will Americans eat more pork? Can the industry export more product? That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. Extending knowledge, changing lives. The MSU Extension Service. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, a workshop for private well owners looking to improve their drinking water. This workshop is actually in four different counties. This is the second one on Tuesday, September 25th at 6 p.m. at the Jackson County Extension Office. A grant is funding the workshop and bacteria screenings for the first 45 people who register in each of the four counties. It's $25 for everybody else. To find out when you can pick up your sample bottles and collection instructions, call 662-325-1788. The results will be mailed to each owner. Next, on Wednesday, September 26th at the Longfellow Civic Center in Bay St. Louis, an income workshop for land and charter boat owners. If you're looking for innovative ways to branch out and earn extra income, this is for you. You'll learn about recreational enterprise potential, inshore fishing charter excursions, and even legal liability. 
Lunch is provided and pre-registration is required. For more information, call Bridget Verone at 228-523-4075. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Pond Bank catfish prices in the U.S. had a slight slip in recent weeks. The snapshot of this market in August shows producers received a Pond Bank price of 96 cents a pound for live fish. That is a drop of 12 cents per pound from a year ago. As prices drop, production is climbing. Farm sales increased 5% and topped 30 million pounds. U.S. processor sales were also up 5% from July, totaling over 14 million pounds. The Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS, this week formally designated China, Vietnam, and Thailand as eligible countries to export catfish and catfish products to the U.S. FSIS says it determined that the inspection system in each of these countries was, quote, equivalent to the system that the U.S. has established under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, end quote. The agency has been working since December 2015 to determine whether the three countries' inspection systems were equivalent to the U.S. system. Well, questions remain about the severity of that outbreak of African swine fever in China. If the disease there does continue to spread, and LaShawn Hackett is pretty positive, there will be a big switch to alternate proteins like beef and chicken for all Chinese consumers. It could have a dramatic effect. The reason is, is that if the Chinese have to cull so much of their herd and they're run into a pork shortage and prices take off, consumers are gonna be looking for alternative meat proteins, poultry and beef. There's simply not enough beef in the rest of the, I mean, not enough hogs and pork in the rest of the world to handle that kind of a shortage. So we could see just a small portion of the Chinese consumer switching to more poultry and more beef, and we could have a massive demand spike that would just overrun both of those markets right now. As for whether China will buy American hogs if things really get bad over there, well, that remains to be seen, especially since both countries are continuing to implement more trade tariffs this month. Here's analyst Darren Newsom with his take on what may happen to the pork market. It's going to reduce some of the supplies of, uh, of Chinese pork. So naturally you'd think, hey, they're going to buy from the U.S. Well, we're in a trade war with them, so they may not buy more from the U.S. So if all of a sudden the supplies of their pork are going down and they're, you know, having to kill some of their herd, you know, the soybeans that we're shipping to other places that is then finding its way to China may not happen. So while it could be argued it's going to be bullish, you know, it could also be argued it's going to be bearish. Well, let's back up to the trivia quiz now to wrap up our markets this week. For beekeepers, honey collection season typically concludes during the month of September. And our question is, how much honey does an average worker bee make in its lifetime? Well, that answer is A, one twelfth of a teaspoon. At this point, demand for pork is actually on the rise, while prices are still under extreme pressure. Packing plant operators have had their eyes on the market, and believe it or not, despite the tariff pressure, are setting their sights on expansion. By early next year, Iowa hog producer Rick Chipman should be able to point his livestock trailer in any direction, and within four hours, reach any of 11 hog packing plants. We've been blessed with a lot of packing uh, space in this area. Um, unfortunately, uh, the industry as a whole uh, needs, uh, needs more. Uh, we have pushed our packing capacity uh, to its limit the last few years. And so it's a good thing that we see additional packing spaces open up. Chipman, whose Chipman Farms near Harlan will feed out nearly 60,000 hogs this year, said he's cautiously optimistic about the five new or renovated Midwest hog processing facilities that are all scheduled to be open by early 2019. It shows the vibrance and the growth of the industry. We really like how companies and groups of producers are investing tremendous amounts in new technology and state-of-the-art facilities. We certainly like the competitive 
spirit that we have between the packers when we uh, go to make contracts. The five hog packing plants will ultimately have a combined slaughter capacity of at least 9.5 million hogs annually. That would represent about 8% of the 118 million hogs slaughtered in the U.S. in 2016. Plant owners are also carefully watching tariff and trade negotiations. The supply is already set on how many market hogs are grown. The demand is determined by uh, how much people want to eat pork in the U.S. and how successful we are at exporting pork outside the country. That is not going to change as a result of new plants being built or not being built. Prestige Farms plant near Eagle Grove, Iowa, is expected to begin operations after the new year, ultimately building to 10,000 hogs a day. According to Ron Prestige, the additional plants should create more competition among packers for market hogs, which could make for increased producer profits in the Midwest, as the facilities aim to operate at capacity when possible. If the supply of hogs increases too rapidly, however, prices could dip instead. We, of course, saw this happen in 1998, is when you run into a situation where you actually exceed shackle capacity, at which point packers really don't have to bid anything for hogs because they've already got all their, their shackles filled. The new plants feature more robotics, snap chilling, and low impact livestock handling, which may offer an operating advantage over older plants, primarily within the Midwest. Increasingly, pork plants are leaning toward vertical integration, with owners or partners supplying a larger percentage of the animals, rather than buying on the open market. The Prestige Farms plant in Iowa plans to harvest some of its own hogs, but will buy nearly half from other producers, including 10% through spot market negotiations. If a second shift is added, those hogs will all be bought from other producers. The poultry industry has evolved to a point where it's almost entirely vertically integrated. I'm not going to criticize other companies that have moved towards a more integrated model. It's not really the big motivation for us. We've just seen a tremendous amount of consolidation in the uh, packing industry and the pork business, and we kind of felt like for the, for the health of the industry, it'd probably be good if there was a little more competition and some new packers. In Wyndham, Minnesota, a group of individuals, including hog producers, spent nearly $70 million remodeling a beef packing plant that had closed less than a year earlier. Now open as Comfrey Farm Prime Pork, the renovated facility brought 500 plus jobs back to the community of 4,500 when it opened in May 2017. Company officials say 80% of the hogs will ultimately come from either plant owners or permanent suppliers. The ultimate goal is for prime pork to sell a consistent product. All the hogs that we get from the three producers will be basically fed the same diet and be, have the same sire as far as the boar. And that is really the key to the customer, is to ensure that when you buy a pork chop today, it's going to taste the same today as it does a month from now. Employees are already processing 4,200 hogs a day, but the final objective is about 5,000 a day. In Sioux City, where the new Seaboard Triumph Foods plant opened in September 2017, Officials said they will be particular when buying one-third of their hogs from independent producers. The company, which will start second shift operations in October in order to eventually process 21,000 hogs a day, wants to make sure those additional hogs also meet quality and traceability standards demanded by a global marketplace. We're also pretty proud of the, the control and the, the quality that that brings by having um, literally the, the ability to bring uh, feed to the hog farm, to the, uh, to the processing center, to the, the package, and, and then delivering that to the customer. Is, it, it generates a very high quality product. Our requirements with our open market hogs are that they're essentially identical in, in uh, configuration, uh, genetics, nutrition, animal care, all of those uh, requirements are, are the same as, as if they were internally sourced. Chipman understands packers need to meet the demand for consistency, 
but worries what it would mean for the industry long term if packers continued to raise more or all of their own hogs. That's been a difficult uh, thing for me to, to kind of chew through. It would be very damaging to independent producers like myself, particularly if the shackle space was completely tied up. When I've approached packing companies in the past, they have seemed to want to keep a balance between ownership and buying from individuals. And that's a good thing. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Kranz. Technology versus capacity, always a big question. Sure is, Mike. And speaking of technology, next week on Farm Week, the technology every farmer knows so well. A century ago, it was a breakthrough innovation. With it, farmers could do more work in far less time. Now, a hundred years later, tractors are more advanced than ever. 2018 is the year of the tractor farming's own industrial revolution. Come take a look back with us at the workhorse of American agriculture, the tractor. That's next time on Farm Week. And remember, if you ever miss a story, look for all the past episodes of Farm Week on our website, msuext.ms slash farmweek. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.